morning. This is Hustler's Meetings. It's Thursday, March 31st, and um, we are, as is traditional, going to talk about uh, education finance generally and S-287 specifically uh, this morning. Um, the House Education Committee, I believe, uh, may be watching on YouTube, which is great, so they can uh, take advantage of the um, the, the walkthrough of S-287 that um, Jim Demaray is going to do for us. And um, before I turn it over to Emily, please let me see if anyone has any questions about the day or about what we're doing or any announcements. See anything? So Emily, it's all yours. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, so we have S-287, which is very exciting. So now we have, it is exciting. So we have objects to work with um, on the wall and on our committee page. And so Jim is going to give us an old fashioned walkthrough. Um, so Jim, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, let's start with on your website posted is an overview document. Uh, let's start with that, just give you a sense for what's in this bill, and it has page references to the bill uh, as well. Do you have that up? I think we're getting there, so give us a okay. second. Just let me know when. So as passed by the Senate. Uh, the document I'm referring to says S-287 overview. Great. We're there. Perfect. Okay. okay. So for the record, uh, Jim Damery, that's Council, we are walking through this overview of S-287 uh, before we do the walkthrough. Um, the first section one is findings, uh, how we got here. Uh, talks about Brigham, uh, Act 173, the waiting study, Act 59, the task force and its report. Section two uh, are the goals. Uh, and the main goal is to fulfill Vermont's constitutional mandate to ensure that all students receive su substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout the state. And th then there are five specific goals. Um, first, to increase educational equity Second, to improve educational outcomes. Third, to improve transparency in the distribution of financial resources. Uh, fourth, to enhance educational and financial accountability. And fifth, to improve oversight of Vermont's K-12 public education funding system. Those five goals will be used later in the bill in the audit section. So when the audit is determining the successes and failures of the act, We'll be testing against these five goals. Section three is uh, uh, just a small change to the definition of long-term membership. Uh, section four amends the definition of poverty ratio, which is used uh, for the coming year in uh, the weights. Um, the change is to um, determine whether a student is from an economically de uh, deprived background, changing that from um, eligibility for nutritional benefits to eligible eligibility to receive uh, free or reduced price lunch. So just to be clear, for the next year, starting in 22-23 uh, school year, we would change the way uh, these students are uh, determined. Um, and then next year, Section 4A, changes it further to say that going forward uh, in that year and thereafter, the test would be uh, whether the student's um, family inco income is 185% or less of the current year for a po poverty level as determined using the Universal Income Declaration form. Um, and the fifth section is requiring that form to be um, uh, ready for use in the 23-24 school year. Uh, so we have, just summarizing, we have an interim change uh, for a 23, 22-23 school year uh, using uh, nutrition benefits 
at, um, using, using a free reduced price lunch, so nutrition benefits, and then thereafter, you're changing it to 195% of FPL using the uh, Universal Income Declaration form. Um, section six is kind of the main section, I guess, of this bill, which is to adjust and add the weights. Um, section 6A on page two um, requires that beginning, beginning in fiscal year 29, um, that the equalized people calculation is a three-year average. You'll see there's a five-year transition uh, where you're using an average of equalized peoples. And what this is saying is that after the transition is over in fiscal year 28, thereafter we're going to use a three-year average uh, going forward. Um, section 6B um, repeals the weight um, if the General Assembly does not update them in five years. So this is kind of a poison pill, if you will. You have to take some action, either to update the weight or to repeal this repeal. But this is designed to incentivize the General Assembly to take some action in five years. Section seven requires ELL, which is English Language Learner Services, to be provided by school districts and provides categorical aid to them, to, to them if they have 25 or fewer EOL students. Uh, section eight eliminates small school grants and allows merged districts, whether merged voluntarily or by state board, state board order, to continue to receive merger support grants unless they get the small school weight. So they get either the weight or the merger support grant, not both. Section nine, nine and 10, sections nine and 10 are conforming changes, uh, just to eliminate references to small school grants. Section 11, 12 to 13, or 12A are all transitional provisions. So 11 is saying that for the um, first three years of implementation, 24, 25, and 26, Equalized pupils uh, for any given year of those years uh, will be the five year average. And then for fiscal 27, it will be the four year average. And then for 28, it will be the three year average. And then in 29, and thereafter, it will continue to be a three year average. And that's designed obviously, obviously to smooth the effect of these changes. Section 12 um, suspends the excess spending penalty and the 3.5% hold harmless provision for the five years transition period. And section 12A suspends uh, the required uh, specified language for a school budget ballot for the transition period. Section 13 requires the uh, Vermont Center for Geographic Information to assist AOE in determining the, the number of persons per square mile. Um, and that's part of, of the weight weighing test. Uh, section 14, page three, requires this, uh, the state auditor to perform an independent audit that identifies the successes and failures of the implementation of the act, looking again, again at those five goals. And that report is due back to you um, by December of 15, 2029. Um, section 15 creates the new Education Fund Advisory Committee that would monitor Vermont's education financing system, conduct analyses, and perform specified duties. Uh, 15A is the appropriation for that, uh, for per diem and reimbursement. Section 16 requires collaboration by the agency and JFO in order to update and maintain the weighing factors and the systems that support uh, those factors. Section 18 eliminates unused exceptions to the excess spending penalty. Uh, 19 and 20 are just minor, uh, minor clarifications and cross-reference change. And section 21 is the effective date section. The following page is um, a uh, walkthrough of the calculation of the homestead property tax rate. This is for your reference. So, for example, when we talk about the fact that we're changing the definition of long-term membership in the bill, you can see it's step number two. 
here so you can find out where you are in the process of calculating homestead tax rates. I'm happy to go through that um, if you want to, or I can go through the bill at this stage. Any questions before the we go through the full bill? Okay. Okay. So now we are looking at um, S two eight seven as passed by the Senate. I'm looking. We're looking at the unofficial version. Um, it begins with findings, as we talked about. So it starts with all oh, through these in detail, but starts with Brigham. Uh, talks about. Uh, Hold on one second, Jim. Yeah. yeah. We have it listed sure twice here, and I don't know if they're the same or different. Yeah, they are the situation. <laughs> it is the I didn't even know that was possible. It should make no difference either one. Okay, you didn't look. There wasn't one. <laughs> That's a secret. There wasn't an official in it. <laughs> no. Thank you. Sorry. I, say, I, I point out the fact that this is the unofficial version because the page number of references and the overview correspond to this version. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And Jim, will you go um, somewhat slowly? I think the devil's in the details here. And so we're reading along. Sure. Yep. Um, so we're going to start with findings, uh, section one. And uh, the first finding is around Brigham and the fact that um, there's a constitutional requirement to offer educational services to students in Vermont. Uh, B talks about the section of law that was put into place after um, Act 60 or by Act 60, uh, recognizing that right in statute. Um, and then um, sex, subsection C on page two um, talks about the fact that students come to school with dis similar learning, learning needs and backgrounds and need different types of support. Um, and then D talks about Act 173 and commissioning the um, weighing factors study. Uh, e talks about the uh, report uh, issued by UVM and uh, Rutgers and uh, talks about the results of that, finding that, find that the weights are um, outdated um, and need to be updated. Um, F on page three uh, talks about um, Act 59, which created the task force on the implementation. So, so, this may not be, I, I'm just going to ask the question and it may not, I, I may not need an answer at the moment, but I'm curious, I, I'm actually reading the findings, so I'm a little mm -hmm. slower than you, so my apologies, but um, I'm curious at some point to know if we decided to use the other option, the cost factor adjustment, whether the findings need to be rewritten or whether they're foundational to either method. Um, I, I believe they are foundational to either method. Okay, so so the the thank you. So we're in F on page three, talking about the creation of the task force on the implementation of the Pupil Weighing Factors Report. Um, and it talks about the, the um, recommendations from that report, which were to um, recommend two systemic exchange options and a series of related provisions uh, for either opting the weights or adopting the cost equity payment approach. So those are the findings. Any, any further questions or comments before I go on? We're good, thank you. Okay, so the goals of this act, um, I, I will read through these uh, specifically because they do play back into the audit, audit function as well. So uh, it says, by enacting this legislation, the General Assembly intends to fulfill Vermont's constitutional mandate to ensure that all students receive substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout the, throughout the state the legislation is designed to, um, one, increase educational equity by ensuring that the financial resources available to local school districts for educating students living in poverty, students with English language learning needs, students in small rural schools, students in sparsely populated school districts, and students in middle and high schools are sufficient to meet 
the cost of educating these students. Two, uh, to improve educational outcomes of students and the circumstances and categories identified um, just, just above by ensuring that financial resources tied to the cost of educating these students are available to local school districts. Um, three, to improve transparency in the distribution of financial resources to school districts by simplifying the school funding formula and better tying educational expenditures to student needs. Four, uh, by enhancing educational and financial accountability, by ensuring that equitable resources are budgeted and expended for the education of students in, in these circumstances or categories, and that regular evaluation mechani mechanisms are utilized to assess educational equity and outcomes, and five, improve oversight of Vermont's K through uh, 12 public education funding system by creating a new advisory body with experience to monitor and recommend improvements to the system. Okay, the, the next part of the bill um, deals with changes to the determination of weighted membership. Um, section three is a change to the definition of long-term membership. Um, and the change on page five, uh, first of all, the word mean is struck. So um, that came from Brad James. Um, but this means the, the average of the district's average daily membership, um, excluding full-time equivalent enrollment of state place students over two school years. So what this is saying is that long-term membership is a two-year average of average daily membership. Um, and you use the current school year, year in the prior year. Uh, and then it's provided that um, language uh, this is how, how students in small schools are accounted, which is a bit different than this two-year average. Um, and it's explained later on in the bill, which we'll get to. And this is done differently because um, I understand Brad James calculates this part differently than the other, um, other ADM figures, or long-term membership figures, which I think we'll have to explain why, but um, I'll go through that, that, that difference. Um, when we get to it. Um, the section four, uh, this is the change to the poverty ratio, which will be used during the next year or so before we, we update the weights in 23. Uh, in 22, uh, the current weights are still used, so we still have this language about the poverty ratio. Um, what this is doing is it is uh, changing um, how students from economically deprived backgrounds are identified. So now it say, says um, before that, um, it'd be a person who resides with a family receiving nutrition benefits, that language has been struck. And now it says, um, uh, means a person who is eligible for free or reduced price lunch, excuse me, lunch under the federal um, acts. Um, and, um, it still has here, which uh, here um, says uh, below that, it says a person who is not eligible for free or reduced price lunch, but for whom English is not the primary language, shall also be counted in the numerator of the, of the ratio. That will be changing in, in 23 and beyond, but for 22 to 23, because you're, you're not changing the weights yet, that remains in place for that one year. Um, section 4A on page six is Jim, again- Jim, can I pause you there? Sure. So the count of 22-23 is what applies to the FY23 fiscal year? The, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand your, your question. This way of counting that is just for one year, that's the free and reduced lunch plus the non-FRL ELL students. Yeah. Is just gonna be for FY23. Correct. Tax calculations. 
Correct. And then, okay, and then there's going to be a different method in FY24. Correct. And the new weights that you're going to get to don't apply until FY24? Or they apply in FY24. Okay, thank you. Yep. One more question. Just to follow up on that, uh, when, when are those counts taken for FY, for the next school year, for FY23? Um, well, the counts are usually taken, I believe, in, in October. Um, we'll come to that, actually, because we'll walk through the weight, the, the weight uh, weighing section, and it gives you the dates by which counts have to be done. Okay, good. I, I'm just trying to reconcile that with the, with the setting the tax rate for the tax bill that goes out in September. Oh, it's a, oh. That's a different year. No, it's, it's a tax bill that goes out for next year. That's next year. The counts in October are for the next school year. The July 1st. That'll be the, so yeah. that'll be for the FY24 school year. That's correct. So Brad so, agrees. So, so <laughs> no, no, that makes sense. So, so in terms of what we're talking about here, which is for, yeah, for yeah, one okay. year. Yeah, let's... Brad, can you clarify? You were not applauding. You were just raising your hand. I was trying to raise my hand, but I missed. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I'm trying to lower everything and get it off. Um, Brad James, Agency of Education. This, this, this was a question I had because what we're doing right now is, is to answer Representative Durfee's question. These counts come from the student census, which is the, the 10th or the 11th through the 30th day of school. So the, if the counts are really taking place in early September through early October, that's when the counts are really being done. So what, what, we, what I have done at this point is taken the, the counts from this year and last year, because that's what we use for this future F equalized pupil count. And I've calculated them using the old DCF numbers. If, and, and this is my question, if, if, we were, if, we, if we were to implement this now, as, as Jim has been talking about, then what that would essentially mean to me, my understanding is that I would be recalculating oh. the, the equalized okay. pupil counts for yeah. FY23, which would in turn change tax rates, would in turn change, change the yield. It can be done, but I just want everyone to be aware of that. Um, I guess, I guess I'll stop at that point and see what people want to say and ask. Yeah. So what, if we're talking about the fiscal 23 tax rates, we need to, the it, it, it is more efficient to use data that we already have. Is that a simple way of understanding it? I, I, think, I think so, because these are the numbers that I've put out already using data yeah. that we already have. Yeah, because we, we don't have much time. Jim, can you do you have any um, recollection of the conversation that led to this sort of single year this construct the way it is? So are you asking me? Yes. I think it came from. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 can I jump in, Jim? Yeah. I, I think I, how equalized pupils are counted and how it's written it can, can get very easily confused. And, and I think I kind of think that's the situation here. Um, we, we, we spent the whole a, a good portion of time in, in the task force talking about using FRL. And I think that's what Jim was following. And, I, and if, if I read this, I missed this in terms of when it was being implemented and such. Otherwise, I would have raised it as an issue. And so if we were going to move to the universal, you know, let's hold this for problem solving and keep on going with the bill now that we understand that this is something to flag. Thank you. I'm going to stop myself there. Jim, back to you. Okay. Okay. So we are on page six, section 4A. Um, and again, I'll just see what the bill says now. Um, um, for Wait, fiscal. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have a clarification question, and I'm going to forget it if I don't ask it now. The, the sentence that says a person who is not eligible for free or reduced price lunch, but for whom English is not is not the primary language, two negatives. 
And I just want to be sure I'm understanding correctly that I'm uh, there's no line, so I'm, at, I'm I'm still in section four at the bottom of that okay. eight there. Yeah. Um, the, the, so that so that person who is not eligible for free or reduced price lunch gets counted once in the numerator, but if the person is eligible for free or reduced price lunch and English is not the primary language, do they get counted twice in the numerator or only once? The way I think I would express that uh, is that the EOL students are counted twice. They're counted separately, and this is the current law, current law. Uh, they're counted separately um, with a weight, and they're also, even if they're not living um, with a low-income family, they're counted again in the poverty ratio. So it in, in, in increases the, the number of students uh, who are deemed to be living in, in poverty or economically deprived, because you're counting the yellow students even if they're not economically deprived here as well. Is it Checking with Brad, he's looking. So, 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 so Jim, is, Jim is correct. Yeah. If I can try it a slightly different way, a, a number of yeah. ELL students are are already counted in the poverty count. Um, they're they're classified as poverty, and so they're picked up in our DCF numbers that we have. As Jim said, there's also the ELL weight, which which is separate, so they're counted over there too. But they're counted twice, so they. Yeah. So they're they're essentially counted twice. Yes, all of them. And this is current law, and the only tweak so to current law in this paragraph is switching from SNAP to FRL for just a single year. Correct. Okay. And then there's a different construct going forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So for fiscal 23, we talked about what happens. For fiscal 24 and, and beyond, we look at section 4A on page 6. And here, uh, the change is to get away from poverty ratio altogether. It's not a factor in the new weight weighting system. It's not done that way. Um, so what this says now is that a pupil from economically deprived background means a pupil whose family income, as determined under the universal income form, um, is 185% or less of the current year federal poverty level. Um, and then the next section is going to require um, that the universal income declaration form is in place for the um, fiscal 24. Should I keep going? Wait, one second. Uh, just another bit of a timing question. Yeah. Uh, um, about the current year federal, I mean, the. I don't know when they update. Is it with their fiscal year in September? But when they update the uh, federal poverty levels? I don't know that either. Maybe Brad does. So I think probably it's something we need to yeah. Yeah. understand. I, 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 do not, I do not know, but I can, I'll ask and see if I can find out. Existential question. <laughs> yeah, Scott. I just, I, 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 maybe I'm confused, but it seems to me like between section four and section five that we're, that we're using the FRL form and the universal declaration form for FY24. Yeah, you're, you're moving to um, two changes really for FY24. The test is different, so now it's 185 percent or less of, of current year FPL. Um, and second, uh, you, you're moving to this universal income declaration form, uh, under which that whether or not the student qualifies will be determined. Okay, but it, is it? But that would would that apply to the 20, FY24 or FY25? That would apply to F fiscal year 24 and beyond. The 23, 24 school year and beyond. Okay. 
All right, I gotta do some reading, I think, but so I'm still a little confused. Because FY24 budgeting is coming up here in the fall. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one more second. And no. this, it's not kind of in the, that 185% is falling out. That's the same, right? Like FRL, SNAP, they all use 185%. So that, that number is uh, consistent in both these methodologies, right? I believe, I'm not sure about nutrition benefits. I believe that the eligibility for free and reduced price lunches is at or below 185%. It's the same. Brad and Brad is nodding, but you can't see him. Can you? I, I'm unmuted. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, the the, the this 185 percent or less is is kind of across the board for lunches or free reduced lunch and such. And I know we'll come back to this when we come back to this time in question. But uh, again, I just need to ask it because I'll never forget. The universal income declaration form. Once this is fully implemented, um, it, it, you, uh, when do people fill it out, um, <laughs> and, and when when is that data going to be available to whoever's making all these decisions in, in a typical fully implemented school year, as opposed to this transition problem. I, I I can I can find that out for you, Madam Chair. I, I I'll put that into the email I'm about to send to Rosie Kruger because she's the expert on an area on the child nutrition su such. Um, I was going to ask her about the federal level, but I'll ask her that question too when these things are done. I think they're done at the beginning of the school year, but I I don't know. I'm I'm not sure if they're done monthly or if they're done once or whatever. I think I think it varies. I think the different programs happening. I'm not an expert on that. I'm asking, uh, is it? I thought it was our own state form, the universal income declaration mm -hmm. form. I'm not talking about federal form. I don't think I'm talking about this form that we're going to use at the state level, which I understand other states use, so there must be a model out there, but I'm curious how the date, how the information is going to flow. I'll, I'll have to ask Rose and see what, 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 she, what she says, because I, I don't know, but I, I understand it is for the, the universal income tax, or whatever it's called, is, is yeah, for, yeah. for our state. Okay, and some districts are using that form already, so there's got it. a way that people are yep. doing it. Yeah, but the, yeah. But the, 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 yeah, the timing super matters. The, the consequences are too Yes, much. absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Back to you, Jim. Okay, all right, section five we've touched upon, but we'll go through it in more detail. So it's the universal income declaration form. It starts with intention language, that, that your intention is that beginning in the 23-24 school year and thereafter, uh, the determination of whether a pupil is from an economically deprived background be changed uh, to what we just talked about, 185% or less of current year FPL, with data collected from the Universal Income Declaration Form. Uh, subsection B talks about the fact that form is used in other states and um, and that um, the benefit, um, uh, it, it creates more accurate pupil counts um, and um, reduces stigma, and that needs to be here at least. Um, and then C is the operative language, which says that on or before October 1, 2022, AOE shall convene a working group that includes school staff and hunger and nutrition experts to develop the universal income declaration form that shall be fully accessible to all Vermont families. The new form should be implemented statewide for the 23-24 school year. Um, until that, that form is implemented, school districts shall continue to determine whether a pupil is from an economically deprived background using eligibility for free or reduced price school meals. David. So just uh, continuing the thread of uh, timing here was, it sounds like the intent here in the very last sentence of section C was that we might not be ready to use the data from this form for FY24. And, and in fact, if the form is only, if, if there's a group that doesn't even sit down to talk about it until October, 
uh, you know, so back to the question of when do parents fill out the form? Um, I'm thinking it will be hard to have that data used for FY24. And in fact, maybe, we'll, maybe we won't be using it. Was that, was that the thinking or the intent? <coughs> I can't speak to the intent, I'm afraid. Um, I think the, and maybe it's what David is struggling with too. I think what's really messing me up um, is that in some places we're talking about fiscal year 24, and in some places we're talking about the 2023, 20, 24 yeah. school year. And I think that's just, I'm just, the way that the Senate did it, I'm just having a little trouble. Consistency. Getting my head around that whole thing. Yeah. They're not good on details. Oh, uh, David, can I, is your question about whether that last sentence until that form is implemented, et cetera, are you, to me, I, I'll, after you asked your question, yeah. I started to read it as that gives some wiggle room for districts that haven't been able to implement the universal income form fast enough to default to the free and reduce numbers is that jim does that language give that space or uh, i don't think it does um it says instead of forms implemented it, the form is required to be implemented for the 23 24 school year okay so yeah. it seems inconsistent those two yeah. sentences so, so uh, this is i think this is a question for brad if, if um if the this transition period um has some districts using the form and some not um, is, 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 do we have to use the same data in order to be able to calculate the tax rates or, or um, I mean, the, the fact that some, some schools use them now is great, but they're using them for, for uh, meals programs, not for determining the tax rate. But the tax rate is a statewide mm -hmm. construct. And I guess I just ask the question of whether everybody has to leap at once <laughs> or stay back together mm -hmm. um, and whether there's going to be an issue if some districts are lagging. My preference would be everybody did the same thing at the same time. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot easier from my perspective. It's a lot easier <laughs> for people to understand. And it's a lot easier to make sure that everybody's on the same footing as, as, as you're suggesting. Um, and, and when, when I read subsection C there, the one that Jim was just talking about that you're questioning, the way I read it was I read it as that the form will be used in the FY23-24 or school year 23-24, so FY24 school year, which means that those counts would be available for the FY25. Yes, Jim. Yeah. Okay. It's, how, it's how I was reading that. Okay. And that kind of goes back to what we were initially talking about that you flagged earlier on the, on the, um, FRL count for current law for um, before before it got changed before it gets changed is I, I was kind of thinking that we'd be using FRL and again I could be wrong I was thinking we, we were using FRL for FY24 and and then we'd be using this new form for FY25 is how I was envisioning things going forward but we but again that that's open to discussion we can come back to that hey. I think at some point soon we're going to need a whiteboard with some dates and make it just sort of all getting in the same yeah. same date. Jim. Yeah, and just briefly, um, Jim, when you were first going through the summary, when you first began, I was wondering why there was this hop and a skip. What I described it as, you know, from um, to the to the uh, universal income form over time to get to the poverty um, calculation, I guess you could say. And as Janet said a few minutes ago, isn't this because we're using, we want to use numbers that we actually have, which seems to make good sense. But I agree now that um, if we all did the same thing at the same time, it would be more straightforward, more accurate if we figure out the timing for that. It's just, it won't confuse people, um, particularly on, at school board meetings saying, why are we doing this, you know? Anyway, thank you. Go back to wherever we were. Back to you, Jim. I think we're on section six. We are, we are. So we're on section six, which is at the bottom of page seven. 
And this is a long section. It's where the weights get applied. Um, so this is kind of a recipe, if you will. Uh, it's drafted as a recipe um, uh, to give clear guidance to um, AOE and business managers as to how this will be done. Subsection A, which was on for two or three pages, is setting the table. So what we're doing here is we are establishing how many students are in each of these categories the waste will be applied to. So um, subsection A, the heading is determination of average daily membership in subgroup lists. And um, I'm going to read through this with you. Um, so first, on or before the first day of December, during each school year, the Secretary of Education shall determine the average daily membership um, of each school district for the current school year. Remember, that's the, the, the count that happens uh, within a 20-day period at the beginning of the school year. So it's the average student count during that period. Um, and the, the ADM determination shall list separately these various categories of students to which weights will be applied. So first, resident pupils in pre-K. Uh, second, resident pupils in K through grade five. Third, uh, resident pupils in grades six through eight. Uh, and then fourth, resident pupils in grades nine through 12. And then, Two says on before the first day of December, same timing during each school year, the secretary shall identify resident pupils from each from economically deprived backgrounds as defined in each school district for the current school year. Three, uh, on before that same time frame, first day of December, the secretary shall identify resident pupils who are English language learners as defined. Uh, in each school district for the current school year. Four, uh, by the same date, the Secretary shall list all school districts that have a population density measured by the number of persons per square mile residing within the geographic boundaries of the district as of July 1 of that year, equaling fewer than 36 persons per square mile uh, 36, to 20, 36 to 54 persons per square mile, or 55 to 100 persons per square mile. Uh, and then that it says that population density data should be based on information from the uh, Vermont Center for Geographic Information. And that says using the enrollment data determined as of October 1. Uh, this for each school district that has a low population density, the number of pupils in each of these categories above A1 through 3. So this is saying identify the low population school districts first, and then identify the number of students in those low population school districts uh, to which the weights will be applied. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One, why is that one October 1st and everything else is December? Um, it's a good question. Um, if, if, if I may, um, because, because enrollment data is, is from the student census and enrollment is defined as the number of students that are enrolled in the school as of October 1st. Okay. Thank you. And then my other question is, and maybe this is too finicky, but um, the most recent U.S. Census data, meaning the annual U.S. Census data, or the I can't say that other word, the every ten years census data. Uh, it's, I don't think that's, that could be clarified. I would think um, it says. Uh, no, we, it can't be ten years. No, I just want to make sure it's not going to be. <laughs> I read that to be, I thought the census data was taken every 10 years. So maybe, maybe there's more to it. There's, there are sub census censuses that, but, <laughs> but we can, we'll figure that part out and we can talk to someone from the GIS office. Okay. Okay. Census is a tough word. Censuses? <laughs> <laughs>
Sensei. 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 Yeah, that's teasing. Um, okay, sorry, Jim. All right, no problem. So we are on page nine still. We're on subdivision five, and we're still counting student groups. Um, so this says on um, before the first day of December during the school year, the secretary shall list all school districts that have one or more schools that have an average two-year enrollment of uh, fewer than 100 enrolled pupils or 100 to, to, 100 to 250 enrolled pupils. Um, this gets into a bit of a complication because the way the two-year average here is done for counting um, small schools um, is different than the usual definition for long-term membership. So usually you, the two-year two um, count is current year and prior year um, ADM makes up uh, long-term membership. That's not being used for this category. This category, uh, to average two year enrollment means the average enrollment of the most recently completed school year. So not the current year, but the previous two years. Uh, and enrollment means the number of people who are enrolled in a school operated by the district on October 1. And the pupil counts uh, whether the pupil is full-time or part-time. Um, that is a wrinkle in this whole thing. It's the only exception to the usual way of counting. I believe that it's here because of the way Brad counts this population. Um, Brad, can you explain that in non-legal language? <laughs> no, no, yes. Um, the, the, way, the way the small school grant currently works, and as Jim was describing, is, is it is a two-year average enrollment that, de that determines the current class sizes or grade sizes, I should say, not class. Um, so, so what we're doing is we're just following what the current law says is that it's, it's a two-year average enrollment. And that's, those would be the numbers that we'd be looking at and using. And the difference between a two-year average enrollment and the average of two years, is that what we're, is that the difference? It, No, I don't. I, I I would interpret them the same way. I mean, you could parse them out and, and probably make a difference, but I, I would interpret them the same way. Um, you, you know, when 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 I say two year average enrollment, what that means to me is I'm looking at you know what what do they have in year one and year two, and I'm averaging them. I say the average of two years it's, to me, it's kind of the same thing. And so, how is that different from ADM? ADM is entirely different um, for for several reasons. First of all, enrollment is where they are enrolled. It is by, by the school, not by the school district that's paying for their education. Our ADM is by district of residence. So it, it's where the kids live and what school district they live in, whereas enrollment is what school that school they go to as opposed to school district they reside in. Um, ADM is a 20 day census period, and it is a full-time equivalency for that 20-day period. That's where ADM comes from. Enrollment is an actual head count. If you were to go into a school on October 1st and actually count the number of heads in there that are students, that is the enrollment. ADM is not a head count. It's similar, but it's not a head count because it's a 20-day average. And if you had three kids who are homeschooling but coming into school for art classes and gym classes, would they become one enrolled student? Because it says yeah. something about time and full time in here. I'm, I, I, be, I believe they would because I, I'm thinking I'm thinking in terms of ADM, I'm trying to take it forward to, to enrollment. In terms of ADM, if a homeschool student goes to a school and takes a course, they are partially counted. So I think that would apply to enrollment. So in this case, if they were there, they would be counted as a student. And can you clarify why we want to use enrollment rather than ADM for this particular category? Because enrollment is at the school level. And, and so that's what's actually telling you what a small school is. If you tried to do it with ADM, it wouldn't necessarily work because we don't necessarily know where school districts are sending all of their children in, in terms of ADM. 
Um, I'm sure the data are buried somewhere in the background, but ADM, ADM is a different beast than is enrollment. And enrollment is school specific, whereas ADM is not. Thank you. David, did you have a? Uh, no, I think you just okay. answered it. Thank you. Back to and just to be, yeah. be clear, why do we use ADM instead of enrollment? In, in general, you mean for? Yeah, yeah. what's the question? Yeah, yeah. We, we use ADM because that's by the district of residence. That's who's paying for the school, for the school children, for the students in that district. And that's where the tax rate information is coming from. It's going back from the school district, to the member towns who belong, that belong to that school district. If we tried to use enrollment for that, um, we would be missing, we would be missing all the tuition students because they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're separate from this to a large degree. Um, but we would also then be having, we would be having a count. If, if I think of South Burlington, for example, we would be taking a lot of the students from Grant, the Grand Isle County who are going to school and, and other counties who are going to school in South Burlington. And so that there would be more kids there in, term, in terms of their, their count because that's where, what the enrollment is showing is those tuition students also. Whereas ADM is not showing tuition students, it's showing where they come from in the homeschool district. And it's not just the district that has to pay for them, it's also the district that's legally responsible for their education. Correct, correct. Thanks. Only subtle little things. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, we're back on you again, page 10. Okay, we are on page 10. We are at the top of the page in subdivision C. So again, we're going through to identify the students who uh, attend or are enrolled in these small schools. So it says, C says using two-year two -year enrollment, list for each school district that has a small school, the number of pupils uh, attending that small school. Okay, so now after we've gotten through all of A, which we just finished, we have all, all of the students listed in these categories. So we know how many there are in each of these categories to which weights will be applied. The next step in B is to determine long-term membership, which is simply taking the current year um, um, ADM figures and averaging with the previous year ADM figure. So long-term membership is a two-year average of ADM. And so it says the secretary shall determine the long-term membership for each school district for each people group described in A above. So now we have a two-year average um, for those groups. Next, we apply the weights. So we are in subsection C, uh, determination of weighted long-term membership. It says the secretary shall determine the weighted long-term membership uh, for each school district. Uh, and then first, the secretary shall first apply grade level weights. Each pupil included in long term membership um, should count as one multiplied by the following amounts. So, top of page 11, pre K, it's a negative um, because it's a 0. 0.46 count. So, you have to subtract one to get to 0. 0.46. And then for grades um, six through eight, it's a positive 0. 0.36 and grades nine through 12, a positive 0.39. So for example, a student in grade six would count as 1.36. Uh, so these are starting from a base of zero. Um, then uh, two, the secretary shall next apply a weight for people from economically deprived backgrounds. Uh, for each people included in long-term membership, um, in that category, we'll receive an additional weight, weighting amount of 1.03. Next, the secretary applies the weight for ELL uh, pupils. Um, they get a, an additional weight of 2.49. And then next, the weight is applied uh, for students living in low population density school districts. Um, so depend, uh, they, it depends on on uh, population density numbers. So um, 
for each pupil included in that category. Um, they receive an additional waiting amount of uh, 0.15, where the number of persons per square mile in the school district is 35 or fewer. Uh, 0.12, where the number of pupils per square mile in the school district is 36 or more, but fewer than 56. Or 0.07, where the number of persons per square mile in the school district is 56 or more, but fewer than 101. And then on page 12 at the top, uh, lastly, um, the secretary applies the weight for students who attend a small school. So it's, a, it's depend, dependent. You don't get this weight unless the number of persons per square mile in the school district is 55 or fewer. Uh, so if you meet that requirement and the school district has a school with an average two-year enrollment of fewer than 100 pupils, then the school district shall receive an additional waiting amount of 0.21 for each pupil included in the small school's average two-year enrollment. Or if there are 100 or more, but fewer than 251 pupils, then the school district receives an additional waiting amount of 0.07 for each pupil included in the small school's average two-year enrollment. And then six says that a school district's, district's weighted long-term membership to equal long-term membership as determined above under B, plus the cumulative weights assigned by the secretary under the subdivision sub subsection. So this is saying you're taking a person's count as one person and you're adding all of these weights up cumulatively uh, on top of that. And the only negative weight would be for a pre-K pre student. So I'm gonna pause there. Um, and Jim, my understanding is that you need to jump somewhere at 10 o'clock. I, yeah, actually I do. Um, okay. So this is a perfect, this seems to me like a good moment to take a break because we're about to slightly transition, right? We are. I, I could get through this one section though for you if you want, because we're almost okay. done. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so language has been taken out in D and E, which is the old weighing way, way process. Um, the hold harmless provision F is still here, so you have a 3.5% hold harmless. Um, secretary has to adopt guidelines as now for, to make sure students are clearly identified. Uh, H, current law again, is, is by uh, December 15th, the uh, final determination of equalized pupils has to be made. And then what's new here is I. Um, so now we have new language that says, it's the intention of the General, General Assembly to consider whether and how to update the weighting factors, not less than every five years. And if they are updated, um, the implementation date for the updated weights be delayed by a year in order to provide school districts with time to prepare their budgets. Updates to the weighting factors may include recalibration, recalculation, adding or limiting weights, or any combination of these actions. So let me stop there. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, we'll see you at 1030. And Brad, I wonder if I could ask you a question before we take a break. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, I've already lost the paragraph, but there's a paragraph right near me on my computer that is about um, the secretary sharing the weights with districts and districts hypothetically commenting on them and then the um, agency correcting them. And that's current law. And so I am, I know that when we sort of were sharing um, work on the task force, we had a number of districts say, wait, wait, that's not right. And so I'm curious if you've ever experienced any districts coming back to you for corrected weights. I think, I think what you're referring to is what's in current statute where there's a time where they can um, basically for all practical purposes amend their ADM counts. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not the weights per se, it's, it's the counts that are below the weights that the weights get applied to. I think that's what you're referencing. Uh, it's H, determination 
of equalized pupils on December 1st of each year, the secretary oh, shall determine okay. equalized pupils for the next fiscal year. Okay, so I, I, I understand where you are now. Okay. okay so so what, what ha what's going on is, again, this all coming back to the census collections. Um, what happens is the districts send their information into our data side. The, the data team over here, they, they, manip they no, don't manipulate the data. They, they, they look at the data, they correct it, they run it through their checks and balances. And what they're doing is they're making sure that students are not counted in the same place twice, the same student. Um, they're, doing thing, they're doing things like that. And so the current law says that we publish ADM counts on December 1, usually they're, get, they're given to our, our folks, use it by early November, they're kind of going back and forth districts through the through up till about the December first. Then they're published and then people see what they are. And then people say, wait, that's not right. I, for, I forgot to put in a grade, which has happened in the past. Um, so I think, you know, that, that's when they find things. And so what, what we do is then we kind of, we kind of allow those changes up until that, that, that stop of December 15th for ADM counts. And so you've had people sort of correct ADM counts in terms of they forgot a grade, but you you haven't experienced districts coming and saying our weights are wrong because you miscounted poverty or something like that before. The I mean there, there's always been a question on poverty because those numbers come to me they come to me from a black box they come from DCF. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, but no, I, I, it's, I guess I trying to remember if anybody's ever said anything about ELL. I don't, because that, that's the count that we pull from the census. And I don't think anybody has, um, because they're the ones putting the numbers in. Um, it's, it's quite possible that, that they put in the wrong number and they realize it after the fact and they let us know. It's, it, it could have happened. I don't remember off the top of my head. It, it probably has, to be, to be frank. Um, I just don't recall off the top of my head because it it's kind of an iterative pop process. I, I kind of do these, tr I try to do these calculations two or three times where they're finally frozen around the 15th. And I'm, and I'm asking for, so when we were sort of doing the task force report and I think Brad and I presented a few times to superintendents or school boards and we got feedback from districts who said our poverty counts are wrong on the sh tables you're sharing. And Brad and I said, if they're wrong in here, they're wrong under current law, and you've been, you know, sort of experiencing the challenges of that up until now. And so, I'm just sort of curious how much people have been paying attention to it up until this point. So, thank you. Yeah, and and we have we have had going to that question um, we, or statement. We have had people say that across the, when they're sending kids to New Hampshire, they don't know if they're in yeah. count as poverty over there, whether they're respond, whether they're reported to us correctly or not. So that's something I need to work with them on. And then the other fun part of current law that I'm curious about is section I. The mm -hmm. secretary shall evaluate the accuracy of the weights established in the subsection at the beginning of a biennium. Yes. Have you ever experienced that happening in your time? Yes. You yes. Okay. Um, unfortunately, though, because of, I mean, we, we have the, the, the pre-kindergarten weight, we have the secondary weight, current law. We have poverty and we have ELL. Those, those are the ways we have. The only one that I can I can really look at and identify, which I've done in the past, is, is the secondary weight because we we don't I I we don't collect enough information for the, the poverty data. We don't collect enough information for the ELL data. So those weights have never been changed. The the secondary weight has it started out when Act 60 first passed, it started out at, at a 25%. So I, in current law, I've said 1.25. Um, weight. Um, and that subsequently was started to be brought down by to, to I think, I want to say I, I, when I first when this first passed, I can't remember when it was, it was quite a while ago, uh, to maybe to maybe 1.17, then we would drop to 1.15. We're currently 1.13. And the only way I could do that was by looking at those districts that have secondary students at a union school and have elementary students at, at a town or a union school. And that that's where those numbers came from. It was not a good way to do it. It was the only data we had though in order to do that to meet to try to meet that section of statute. And we haven't done it for a couple of years because of the waiting study. Um, I'd be curious about sort of what data you would need to make regular recommendations. And you don't have to answer that question now by any means, Brad. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, 
Anything else for Brad on the section before we take a break? Okay.